Hi guys, it's great to be back with you and I'm delighted to have George, my main man alongside me here, to discuss the interesting topic of the Yanigazawa range and specifically the difference between the elite model and the professional model. So just to explain a little bit further what that actually means. So I have just been playing on a Yanagazawa W01 professional uh, series saxophone and to my right here, and I'm going to demonstrate this a little bit later, is a W010 model. Um, so it may be a little bit confusing for you guys if you look at all of these different Yanagazawa saxophones on our website, you see all sorts of different numbering systems and you're wondering how to sort of differentiate them. So this is going to be a video hopefully that explains those differences um, but I'm going to pin it down to the difference between as I say the professional and the elite series instruments. So in a nutshell we've got the W01, we've got the W02, we've got the W10 and then we've got the 20 and then you've got the fancy solid silver stuff above that. But it's subdivided into 1 and 2 as being the professional series and 10 and 20 being the elite series and there are further divisions within the professional and within the elite. So within the professional, I mentioned one and two. What are the differences? It's a very simple difference. The two is bronze and the one is brass. And then the same applies with the upper series. So you've got the 10 being brass and we've got the 20 being bronze. So then the next question that you would naturally ask is, what is the difference between the one and two and the 10 and 20, the professional and the elite? And that the question we are going to hopefully answer today, John. Yeah, exactly. So the, um, this is a question we get asked a lot in store. Um, but to be honest with you, there's probably more similarities than differences. Um, I agree. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we may as well go through the actual technical dif uh, differences. Mm. So let's start the top of the horn. Yeah. So obviously, as you can see, the difference straight away is we have an underslung octave mechanism. It's a very obvious visual difference. And in fact, it is the most obvious visual difference if you're just staring at the saxophone from a different uh, distance that is the thing that you see to, to tell it apart because yeah, exactly. other than Straight that away. you can't really tell no. you know, about the other things you're about to reveal right now yeah. so it's this thing right at the top here yeah um overslung and underslung. underslung sorry there we go but yeah personally um i do i feel like that it's a little bit more responsive when you're whizzing up and down the saxophone um so you find this a bit more responsive. yeah sorry yeah the, the elite yeah. model um yeah, so some of the uh, older vintage saxophones, it was, it's obviously been seen before and mm. um, yeah, it's, it's held its own in the saxophone game and that's why it's been put onto this lovely horn. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's the, the first difference. I mean, it's a funny thing for me personally because I find that it's this we see on practically every other majority, modern saxophone yeah. and you can't say that there's anything wrong with, I don't know, Salman references and no. Yamaha this, that and the other. Um, but yet, yeah, Yanagazawa do choose to, to use this um, octave key style. Mm. Um, and I think, for my money anyway, it's, it's partially a bit of an aesthetic thing. As you say, it's, it, it's uh, pointing a finger to the past. It's got a beautiful look to it. Yeah. Um, whether there's actually a difference um, that you really do notice yeah. when you, you, you know, you're it moving through those passages. <laughs> I think it is milliseconds. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think a lot of that work um, that the player does in terms of changing octaves is done with the body. Mm. The octave key is exactly, just an yeah. assist, as it were. Yeah, really. Uh, but it's a nice thing to have. It looks great, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with this, and there certainly ain't anything wrong with that no, either. No, no, no. Um, but the idea is that it, there is a slightly faster response. So that's the first thing. Yeah. What's the second thing? Second thing, moving down, we've got the ribbed construction here. So I don't know if you can quite see on the camera, but there is a sheet of metal that runs all the way down the body of the instrument near enough and yeah rather than the, on the O1 or the Pro model which has like the single solder points up the sax um, yeah and I, this will obviously add like real weight to the horn because it's adding actual more metal um, but yeah it's, uh, it's it makes it feel more sturdy in my opinion like yeah. it, it feels it feels like you could chuck it about a bit if you ever wanted mm. to do that with the saxophone but I know uh, what you mean yeah there's a sturdier build to it certainly yeah. because you're you're having posts soldered onto a plate that's then in turn mm. soldered onto the body so you've definitely got that um, build aspect going on there in terms of its tonal differences 
Um, it, again, it's another interesting point because, um, you know, all the vintage horns with a great tone to them, you know, Mark VI, the famous one, that I think that's just, just had their post soldered straight onto the body. Exactly, so it's yeah. a slightly lighter build. Mm. Um, and in, in a way, you could say that the, the, the saxophone resonates more immediately because there's less mass there yeah. for the player to push through. Mm. You know, it takes a little bit more to, to get this instrument going, as it were, because there's a little bit more resistance there. Yeah. But we're only talking subtle levels, and yeah, it does exactly. give you, if you like, an extra gear that you can push through as a player yeah. to it, get that extra resonance you, out you of it. You could argue, you're exactly right, Jim, but you could argue that it's a, it could be more versatile because of that resistance, the initial resistance, mm -hmm. like you could get a bit more breath to your sound with yeah. re more resistant horns anyway, so yeah. you could yeah. you, so you get the best of both worlds with, yeah. with that. Yeah. That, well, that could help that anyway. Yeah, it's, exactly. I mean, later on we'll prove it with a slightly more kind of technical approach to comparing these two, and I'll play a bit on this, play something very similar on this, so we can hopefully hear these differences, which, as you can probably imagine, are going to be subtle, because, you know, we are talking three differences. I've just given it away there. We've mentioned two of them so far, and there's a third one coming up. Yeah. Um, but they're not sort of groundbreaking differences. We're not dealing with a change of bore tape or anything like that. Um, I should say at this stage, whilst I'm on the subject, the basic bore shape, the material, it's identical between this one and this one, which is why, you know, you look at the two and they look exactly the same. And it's just these three aspects, uh, three main aspects anyway, where it differs. So we've mm. just mentioned the second one, which yeah. for me, for my money, is the is main one. The, the, yes, this business of the uh, yeah. rib body construction or strapping system is another word for it. So third one. Yep. Uh, last not least, we have the, the double arms on your lower keys here, on your C and your B. There we go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's going to be uh, give like more of like positive feel and a better seal down here. So you might yeah. find, <clears throat> excuse me, the lower, no lower notes might be easier to achieve yeah. uh, because of that. Um, but yeah, I don't know, do you feel like it makes it a bit more heavy, do you think? Well, it could be a minor amount of weight yeah, there. The, 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 the action on these... A couple of arms, really, so yeah. it's a subtle thing. But the action on these instruments, are so they're so light, positive anyway, so... Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a funny thing for me because I think this is a great sax, sax I've just played on there, and many top-level saxes have just single arms and mm. they play perfectly well. Mm. I don't find when I'm playing these bottom notes that I'm, oh God, I, if only I had the double arms, I would have made that B or that B flat. For me, <laughs> yeah, it true. all still works perfectly. Yeah. But if you like, it's a sort of extra insurance mm. for me that you've got two arms on these larger keys that potentially could have more flex. Um, especially when you blow a lot of air down them, the idea is that if you put a lot of air down it, if you only got a single arm there, actually the, pads themselves, or the, the um, what do we call these? The keys? The keys. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what you were asking me then. Can actually flutter under yeah. the breath pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I've heard of this, people who play really yeah. strongly. Jason Marshall, these, yeah, where he, he came into the shop actually, and I was uh, chatting with him, and uh, he, he was playing like a, a nine star super jet. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've told you this story. Um, but yeah, he was blowing so hard down his sack, it was so loud, I was going to say, my ears were ringing after it. Yeah. Um, and his E-flat was popping open, so okay. every single time he'd go for a low C or any of these notes, yeah. it was just, it was really difficult for him. I was like, mate, you need to take it easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah the double yeah. arms would definitely, yeah. uh, definitely help with that Yeah, that's problem. a way of shoring up that problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, maybe over time as well, perhaps if there's going to get, uh, you know, you've got a little bit of wobble in these single arms, you could run into some difficulties right now, this is brand new, perfectly set up feels great to me. Mm. So it's a sort of extra insurance for that kind of area. Um, I mean, it's not really going to have a tonal effect. It's just no. much more about the sort of playability and reliability, shall we say. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, look, I mentioned a little while back three main differences, and we, we've summed it up right There's another there. one you're forgetting. I, I'm just about <laughs> to take it on, but go on, you do it. Yeah, the, you're going to say engravings, yeah, I hope. I yeah, am. There we go. So yeah, we've got to the, uh, some extra lovely engravings on this one. Yes, let's get them Here in the right. Here we go, side by side. Yeah. Basic. Fancy. That's what you got. <laughs> That's it. All you need to know. Basic yeah. and fancy. So, but you know, as I mentioned previously, otherwise it's identical. We've got the same taper, we've got the same metal going on. Um, there, there, there are no other differences. I should just say at this point, um, this is the 10 and it's brass. I mentioned earlier that you've got the 20, which is bronze. Uh, the, the bronze version does actually have a metal. And pad reflectors, which 
does give an extra sort of power and sort of crispness in the sound. I mean, the, the bronze already gives you a weighty sound, but the metal reflectors will give you a bit extra sort of punch in there. Um, whereas all the other models, the one, the two, and the 10, just have the regular plastic um, reflectors, which just give a nice sort of, you know, sonority, sort of naturalness in the sound without that extra spike that you get with the metal. Um, but other than that, um, really that sums up the, the differences. This yeah. is what you need to know. And I yeah. think what might be useful for you guys now is just to hear a little bit from, from one to the other, other yeah. and then we'll have a, a brief chat afterwards and see what we think. Alrighty. So uh, I'll just go straight into playing something fairly simple and regimented um, and clean, hopefully. I'll try and do the same thing on this one and we'll see where we're up to. Well, it's quite hard to say because it's just mm. been a little while whilst I've just been setting up my mouthpiece and reading, trying to get the read in the right position. But I think I'm feeling a little bit more openness in the sound, mm. um, which is kind of what you expect. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm pushing it a little bit more. I don't know if this is a psychological thing. I'm trying to push it more because I expect this saxophone to go a bit further with mm. the strapping, as you say. But it really does feel like kind of the same instrument. You yeah. know, I'm blowing the same instrument and the, the tone has shifted slightly. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's, I hate using this word, but I've, I've used it many times in the last month or two while doing videos. <laughs> subtle. Uh, subtle yeah. is the word here. We're talking that. subtle changes. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, they're both great. There's no denying that they've, mm. they've got all this tonal capability. Um, and I don't know if I just I pushed it a little bit more there because yeah. naturally I wanted to, as I say, because it's got this sort of strapping on it. Uh, Tell me what you I thought. I'm going to because butt you're in listener. here. Yeah, um, you could say because the horn it will make you play differently because I know the subtle differences there, mm. but it will make you play completely differently, and that's going to change your tone on uh, on the outside anyway. Um, what just knowing that just, it's this just, model. Just, no, because like talking about the the strapping or yeah. the rib construction, or whatever, and we we said that that is the the key point that makes the difference. Yeah, I agree. To but to the like it's behind the horn where the difference is. Yeah. But of course that translates out to the horn, yeah. to the listener as well. Yeah. Um, so it's like and partly because you know it's deemed to be the elite saxophone, you might want to like kind of push it to to its limits more because you know that you'd think it arguably like it would it would yeah, take kind it. of hold up it, sort yeah of thing. yeah um and what it, are you hearing there as i played the same kind of phrase one <clears> to the other are, are you hearing that tonal difference i am like it is definitely i would say i want to use the word it's a richer sound and i would also say that it has more projection as well but that's because it's the horn is demanding more air i mm. would say yeah that's, so it that's changes the, re the way to play yeah, exactly that's basically the, does that's, its job yeah yeah. So you, yeah, it will it will shape your sound a little bit differently, mm. definitely. Which in itself is a strong enough reason to go to this level of an instrument. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah. several hundred pounds more, so it's you know you guys at home are thinking, can I justify it? What are the differences? And we're obviously talking something that's subtle here, but it's not just a case of you blow the same on this one, then you blow the same on this one, no. and th these are the results. It it actually forges your playing into yeah. a different groove, which is an important thing in itself. Is what yeah. Well, when when, I, when I've played them, I I when you when you're behind the horn, you do feel like they are quite different horns. Mm. Like it's I know the the technical specifications aren't they're not miles apart, mm. but when you are behind them, they do feel like a different machine. Um, mm. It's not mind over matter either. It actually, they are different. Um, but yeah, you, you would literally have to play them, try yeah. them. To, to, yeah, to, to know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Well, listen, it's been really interesting yeah. because I've, I've not really 
gone into as much depth on this before when I've done my own, mm. you know, testings between this one and this one. I've done it in the past, but it's good to have someone to sort of, um, you know, springboard off in, mm. in terms of their views and how it sounds to them. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you with everything you're saying there. And um, I suppose, you know, there's an argument to say that if you are interested in a Yanagazawa, you you realise what they're going to give you tonally and response-wise and everything, and you have got just a little bit more dollar to spend, then you there's nothing that's going to detract from your sound by going for the upper model. So I, I would probably urge people to go for this one, yeah. um, especially if you're a bit more of an experienced player and you do have that capability to put the air through it. Yeah. This one is going to um, make more demands of the player yeah, and give you sort of... Definitely. Bigger results, bigger, better results. Yeah. It'll, it'll make you work harder in a good way. In a good say. way, yeah. yeah. And that's the conclusion there, George. Yeah, I that's, like what, it. that's what I'm here for. So <laughs> there you have it, guys. That is the Pro versus the Elite. This is obviously a tenor example here. The same basically applies with the other models as well, with Alto and Soprano, etc. Um, hope you enjoyed this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already and give us a thumbs up if you like this video. See you on the next one.